everybody, this is Sarcastic Chorus, and I'm here to talk about She-Ra, Season 2. And this is going to be my real talk, so I'm going to just give all my honest thoughts and opinions on the season. You guys have probably seen my Sarcastic Summary. If you haven't, go back, go watch it. It's hilarious, I promise, and a bit sad. I mean, we, we saw what happened to Cash here. I mean, okay, let's start here. Okay, now first, first, I wish you all the best. I mean, it's New Year 2020, and I want to say thank you all for subscribing. Thank you all for watching. It honestly means so much to me. This whole channel has been a bit of a journey, and this December was fucking amazing. Because you guys, you came out, you supported, you started watching my content, and it has just meant the world to me. So thank you so much. Now I'll get right into the video. So this season, this is probably the fun season in that it has the least dark content. Again, it's iffy, but it is technically, I think the lightest has the most light-hearted content of the seasons, if you just go episode by episode. The only dark bits we see is, and let's start here, the Catcher and Shadow Weaver relationship, because goddamn, it is so sad to watch Catcher pine for that woman's love. And it is so frustrating because from the minute go, I know it's like, oh, she's gonna screw her over. She is going to leave her. And she does. It's like, Katra, you're getting played, damn it. I know, it's just, ugh. And the worst part is it's so real in that you get it. You could understand why, despite how much Katra says, oh, I hate Shadow Weaver, she's just cruel, she's a monster. She still wants to be loved. She still wants Shadowy's attention. She still wants that approval because her entire life has been about getting that. As much as she's like, try to be like the rebellious daughter, she's always been like, I don't really care. She's cared so much. And Adora's always been the one who's got that attention. She's always been the one who got the special attention. She's always been the one that's been like the golden child. Well, Catcher's just been the mistreated pet, it almost feels like. So watching them go and like, shall we ever start working here? It's like, you are just like me. I'm like, God damn it. Don't, no, damn it. No, fuck, catch up. That's the hard part of the season to watch. It's great storytelling. It's like, this totally works for the character. You just don't want it. You don't want the bad things to happen. You, as much as like, oh, Katja, she's terrible. She's still like the most interesting person in this story. And you kind of just want the best until season three happens or really 2.5. And it's like, yeah, you're going to have to work for that redemption arc. You are really going to work, need to work for it. So, Catcher Shadow Weaver, that's sad, but it's very interesting and you just get it. I really love, though, is the bad girls trio we get this season. We get Catra, Scorpia, and Entrapta. Those three are just so fun to have together because they are such zany personalities and they just mesh so well. Scorpia is by far like, the nicest one in the group where she's like super kind, super sweet, just wanting to like, have fun. Definitely wants to date Katra. I don't, don't at me. It's definitely what's going on. And Trapta is just her weird zany self. And Katra's just like, I can't believe I'm dealing with these idiots. She's like, she looks like she needs a hard drink. Stat. And it just works. The group dynamic between them, it works. I'm so happy that we get kind of like the main trio of Adora, Glimmer, and Bo. Then you have like the other tri trio of Catra and Trapta and Scorpia. And you really get to see how the our main girls and Dora and Catra treat their respective circles. It really kind of helps drive home their personalities and life choices. Of just highlights of this season, I've already said talk about Shadow Weaver and Catra, but can we talk about that D&D &D episode? Because that shit was gold. I don't know what you about you guys, but I always love when there's an episode where they just break from the usual style. Because that's always when I think it looks the best. He's like, he's got to see Glimmer in her anime flashback. He's like, oh, everyone's like super stylized. Catcher looks very sexy in the dress. You have Kyle with his pompadour Josuke hair. It just always looks so great. And the thing is, like, you can't 
have that super detailed stuff in the show because it's just not in the budget. It's hard to make it move. But when they get the, but they're still great artists on the team. It's just because they don't do that style doesn't mean they're not good. It's just easier to work with. So when they get the chance, they go crazy, and I fucking love it. I even loved when they did the OG costumes and Bo's vision. Though I especially loved Mermista's dress. I loved the old OG Mermista costume on Mermista. Because, I don't know, it just looks so good. It looks I like the down hair. I like the seashells. I like the color scheme on her. I like her original. I like her current design. But I do think, like, of everyone else, she's the one that it actually works with. Everyone else is a bit more... Oh, it's like the oldest. With her, it looks like... Oh, no, I could legit believe she could wear that in this show. And I also loved how we got to see, like, more personality from each of the characters. Like, Perfuma and her legit just attack on time. Where, like, you have the giant colossal time like over the wall and like getting ready to destroy everything like i mean okay what happened to the peace lover she's like as soon as like violence works and it's okay mayhem it's just so funny that she's the one that's going super crazy like it's fun between the mayhem frosta what happened to her personality now I can see like it's like oh no she was having to put up a front because in the first season she was very uptight she was very like I will have this all work this is all going to be organized it's going to be controlled season two she is just wild child tr basically glimmer on steroids for just let's go fight let's go attack I'm like okay what happened to her between seasons I know you can say like oh no she was trying to be all proper and etiquette I'm like. This is just so out of left field, it felt like. There wasn't a big enough like hint like, oh, this is what she's really like. So that just, when she shows up at the beginning of the season, I'm like a bit like weirded out. Like, what? Like, it does almost feel like a retcon where I can, I would believe that that's her original. This is what they always intended, but we don't get the hints. Like, that's how much she actually acts in real life or in like real cartoon, you know what I mean? So that was weird. I did love how Glimmer had to deal with a character acting like her. Because she kind of needs that. She needs that reality check of, okay, I'm the leader. And god damn it, Glimmer. Or Frosta. Where she have that, wow, that element that's like constantly not doing what you say. Constantly doing what they think is right. Which is the staple of pretty much every show, cartoon ever made. But in real life, you have that character It's like, no... No, you don't do that shit. You don't get off that easy. You get punished for that crap. So I love in Boko No Hero Academia where like the kids like break off, they go do their own thing for the little adventures, ignore their teachers, and then they do get punished for it. Which I love. It's like it's putting consequences because we know they're gonna end up well okay. We know that Glimmer doing something wild is gonna probably end up in her favor. But there's because they're the main character, but there still needs to be consequences, I feel like, for the most part. I like it when there is consequences. Though I do understand that when shows don't have them. Because then it kind of just puts a damper on the whole plot. Some people are like, oh my god, this new she writes to too... Whatever. I'm like, guys, no, it's not. This is actually a really good show. You just have to kind of look at it for what it is, not what you want it to be. And take off the nostalgia goggles for the original. Which I still haven't seen. Huh. You know, I'm probably just going to rewatch the, two, the early 2000s He-Man before I watch the original She-Ra. Nothing against the, the, the current She-Ra. It's the, uh, the past She-Ra. It's just, of the things I really want to get back, that show is probably up there. And you guys know that they're making a He-Man sequel? Yeah, it's like Kevin Smith, of all people. The guy that did Clerks, he's making, it's not just a reboot, it's a proper sequel to the first T-Man story. I think it's going to be like anime style. Which I'm very... There's a thing where it's like, He-Man is fun. But a lot of it is the camp. It's so cheesy, it's so 80s, it's so funny. So if you try to like, oh, this is a hard, gritty, badass story, and try to like drag it over, 
you're kind of going to lose half your audience there. And people are like, oh, He-Man. This isn't like the He-Man we remember. So that is very much... It concerns me. I think Kevin Smith is a great... I love listening to his podcasts. I've never been overly in love with any of his work, though. He's like, it seems like a great guy. I'd love to chat with him, love to get a beer with him. But he, I've never been like, I've never been a huge fan of Clerks. I've never been a huge fan of like a lot of his comedy, but he just seems like such a fascinating person. But getting back on track, I like this season, but it is half a season. That needs to be said. This season two and season three were meant to be one whole season, but then Netflix said, no, we're just gonna just do six episodes a season from now on. Apparently, Chris was like, okay, well, I'll have to plan around that. We'll just figure that. And then like, oh, no, no, we'll just go back to the 13. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Netflix, get your head out of your ass. Like, if you're going to say how many seasons, plan that shit out. The fact that Katra allegedly dies at the end of the season is such a... It's just not a move that you would do. It feels like something that you'd be forced to make. But it just feels like a, a pointless cliffhanger. It's like... In The Walking Dead, they had a whole scene where they had the guy Negan attack the cameraman, like, do a point of view, kill a guy, have us not know who he killed, and have him make us wait till the scene. I always found that to be very cheap. It's a very cheap way to get attention. Like, it just makes the creator seem very insecure. Like, we're not sure if we're going to come back next season, so we have to, like, do something super drastic to make sure people will tune in next season. I'm like, no, you don't have to do that. If you're... Writing is suit quality if it's an enjoyable story. You don't need to do something that cheap to pull, to drag us, to pull us in. Again, because this is the only a half of the original season, this is where we have a lot of the lighter episodes because after the season, it's one storyline with no filler whatsoever. So like, there's no like one-off episodes like to help ease attention. No, this is all just one continuous story. Where all, like, the fluff was, not fluff, the actual, like, adventures of one-off characters. It's all in this first half. So it's definitely the fluffiest of all the seasons. But that's only because all the hard stuff was in the later half. They were kind of getting us ready for this. Well, getting us ready for this shit. Now. Bo's dads. I didn't know that he had dads. And I honestly, I think they're adorable. I always wonder though, do they just have surrogates that do like have the kids? Because Bo looks like both of his daddies. It looks like he is a combination of both their facial features. So I always wonder, is there like a combination where they combine genetics to make Bo or like, because I always love, this is the other thing about fantasy and like worlds and technology, like, is it like ours exactly in medical technology, or is there other advances to it? That was one of the things I had of the Dragon Prince when we had the two queens. I was like, okay, so we have the two mothers. Is there like m- any magic involved? I'm no, it's super weird. I'm just like, I just just want to know more. It's like world building, like info. It's like because the looks she always look. Nah, don't get too far in. It's just, I'm always curious. I'm always like fascinated. Like, do you just do it like us? Or do they have some extra, like, level of magic tech in the background? Because this is, like I said, they have, like, 12... Like, bro bro has a lot of brothers. So I'm just wondering, what's... Is there anything el- extra to that? But if if I don't get any info, I don't really care. It's just something that, like, huh, I'm, I'm just curious about that. But I do love the dads. Did not know about Dream Daddies before the show, though. For those of you that don't know, there's two characters in this... It's this daddy simulator dating app or a game where there's two characters that look suspiciously like Bo's dads. I found this whole thing about on Tumblr and I was like, no, they actually do look alike. I'm curious if that's like an homage to it or is just like a happy coincidence. I especially love the episode in Up North. I love the episode where they take Adora really out of the equation by having her be, let's be honest, blackout drunk. She's trashed this episode because you could get away with alcohol or you can get away with that in cartoons so long as it's not officially, like, intoxication. Which I always felt like a dumb thing. It's like, 
oh, you can be drunk, you just can't be drunk from alcohol. But I love the scene where you get, excuse me, you get Scorpia and Seahawk talking. Because in a show that's like, you have the main characters, you have their supporting, their side, not side, you get their main friends, then you have the side characters, then Seahawk is the side character of a side character. So it's like, you get to see things from their point of view. Like, Scorpia is desperately trying to connect with Catcher, and Seahawk is feeling, like, out of place. He's getting, kind of, he feels pushed out of Mermistic's group, and he's seeing, like, these two, technically enemies, just connect about that. They're, like, relating to each other about how they feel and just how their lives are going. I love that. I love that scene of people just being people. I honestly, if they ever did a spinoff of Scorpion and Seahawk sailing the high seas, I would be so down. And that was the episode that really made me like and appreciate Seahawk because it gives him a lot more vulnerability. Underneath that, all that bravado, he has worries. He is scared. He has issues. I will say, though, I have no idea how fucking old he is. Seahawk. I don't know how old you are. You could be 23. He could be 18. I don't know. Because he has the full mustache. He has the square shoulders. Like, I don't know how old that guy is. And I don't know how... I always assumed Mermista was around Glimmer's age. Who was like 15, 16. So I'm like, wait, how... What's the age dynamic between Mermista and Siak? Are they same age or is he a few years older? It's... Like, okay, I'm not sure how this works. Then again, Atrapta is 29 to 30-ish, so... You can't really tell in cartoons sometimes. You just have to let things go. And just pray that, canonically, this isn't a creepy relationship or a creep factor. I will say this is... this. I will say this is the season that made me actually appreciate Glimmer. Season one, I she went from annoying to tolerable. Then this season where she, I actually started to enjoy her character. Because Glimmer has issues. She can be very annoying. But she, honestly, she tries. And when she's not being super petty and jealous. Or very possessive like she was of Bo. She can actually be very enjoyable. But she has a bunch of those negative traits of not trusting people sometimes. And not being able to really get in sync with her friends. That can kind of make, who we do tend to like, uh, just on the get-go, Adora and Bo have much more likable personalities from like, oh, Bo, he's a great guy. We immediately key into him, Adora. Oh, she has an interesting backstory. She has, she desperately wants to do good. She's the main character. We key into that. So then Glimmer, on the other hand, is like, we have a much rougher start to her, but this season she comes into her own, I think, where she is putting in the work. We don't get to see a lot of her more negative attributes, and when she does get angry, it is completely justified. Her having to put up with all of Cash's shit when she's their prisoner is hilarious, because you want her to snap. You want her to hit Catcher, because Catcher is pretty much asking for it, trying to make Glimmer get mad. And it's funny to see Glimmer get mad, and it's going to be even cathartic to when she does finally snap. So like that, it works. Having her be angry for the right reasons, but she Glimmer can get angry for the wrong reasons, and that gets very bad, very annoying, very, uh, are we really doing this real quick, which was season four, where Justified, in the mental space she's in, but it does her no favors in the, oh, we want to be around this character. Swift Wind is still pain in my ass. I was extremely disappointed when he got his whole episode arc. I did laugh, though, when he was pretty much absent the rest of the season. Like, Swift Wind, okay, one episode to get to know the horse. Just gone the rest. Make some side appearances. It's like, okay, that's what you're gonna do? Like, I am appreciate that he's gone, but there's almost a point where you're like, okay, why don't you just give him more character development so he's a little bit less annoying? 
rather than having him pop in for some bad jokes then popping back out. But hey, if you have to make one, give him less screen time, I'll be happy. Now. Now. I enjoyed Adora's story arc in this season where she's like trying to not be Mara. She has this whole weight of like being a failure in her mind that the last she destroyed the world technically. And she's like, oh, I can't be like that. Oh, and there's this whole mystery of, oh, what's the signal? Where can we find it? It's bogged down in the fact that we, as the audience, key in almost immediately. If you tell us that, oh, this previous hero was, did this horrible thing, and you don't go into detail what she did, logically, we assume, like, oh, it's probably a misunderstanding. Like, I fully expected her, and we know, going in, like, oh, Mara did something good, which is confirmed in the next season, but it's kind of weakens Adora's story. Her, this, all this anxiety she's having of being the next Mara is kind of like, we, as the audience, know, no, Mara was a good person. We can tell. We get, just get this feeling. So, like, all this, it just but it makes Adora's story a bit feel not pointless, just... Just get to the reveal already. We already know what's going on. Yeah, you know, it's like that. It's like, we know the secret. So the buildup doesn't have as much effect on us. Seeing her struggle is like, just find out the truth. Just hurry up. I did laugh, though, because I felt like this season is building up to an angst off between Catra and Adora. Adora is like, shit, shit, shit. The, no, the writers are like, shit, we make Catra way too interesting. And we're not going to make her boring now. So, like, we need to add more stuff for Adora to worry about. So he started throwing, oh, no, she has to be worried about her friends. She has to be constantly worried about Catcher. She has to be constantly freaking out about being the next Mara. They just start adding all this shit to make Adora, like, stressed out. I'm like, it works for Catcher. It kind of works for Adora, but it feels like you guys are trying to push some of Catra's baggage onto Adora so that they seem at like a level playing field when Adora's crap isn't as complicated because we don't know how Catra we know how we don't know how Catra's story is going to play out we have a general idea of how Adora's will so having all this like extra stuff to Adora is fine but it does like the Mara storyline it's that one we called from minute one. We key in immediately that Light Hope is sketchy as fuck. We key into these twists that are coming that aren't bad. I think they're well executed later on, but we know the secret, so Adora's storyline doesn't have as much weight to it. It's only when Adora's worrying about Katra and the folks on their relationship does that become really interesting, where it becomes really engaging for us. And so that's the one where I'm like, okay, no, no, I'm, I'm in. Here, please tell me more. Also, I still laughed at the... Okay, last thing. Not last thing. So yeah, I really enjoyed this season. It's been basically a big improvement for me all across the board from season one, which was a lot of setup. It's like, oh, let's go find this princess. Let's go find this princess. Here, it's like, okay, we got our group together. We got our main cast. Now let's start fleshing out these characters let's start fleshing out the world let's getting some more personality out of them so that's very enjoyable i highly enjoyed it again it's bs that this whole season was split in half because you really do need to watch these two back to back to really appreciate the whole there's a lot of story threads that they set up about like adora is not sure she can handle catch up because she has such a way of getting in her head then the climax of season three is catcher is this Adora putting Katra out of her head, saying like, fuck no, I'm going to take her out. I am going to fight. So we get that in season three, but it's set up in season two. So it just kind of needs to be connected for us to really appreciate the crafting, the story that's being told. But overall, really enjoyed it. A lot of funny bits, a lot of great moments, and... Hey, it always makes me wanting more. So if y'all will like, share, and subscribe, that'd be a big help to me. I'm really trying to push this channel farther, see how much more growth we can get each month. And hey, I'm really excited. 
stay tuned to Monday. I'm going to be dropping the season three or season 2.5 really of She-Ra. And then I'm also going to be posting questions and possibilities for what show I'm going to review next. I'm leaning towards Ledger of Korra, though I'm also thinking I'm going to do a poll of a few other shows to see which one you guys are really feeling. But hey, I wish you all the best. All right, peace out, everyone.